Chapter 16. When Major McEvoy came home later that night, I accosted him the second he stepped through the door, demanding that he say whether Edmund and Isaac had been moved to somewhere else, and if so, where. At first, he just looked stunned, and maybe he'd forgotten he had a 15-year-old daughter. And then he smiled a little and said, I don't think we've been properly introduced. I'm Lawrence, Lawrence McEvoy. And I thought, okay, I can play the let's be all polite game too. And I said very sweetly, like the well brought up girl I am. And I'm Daisy and I want you to, and I want to know where my cousins are. He smiled a little and looking at me in a searching kind of way for a minute, maybe trying to figure out whether I was planning to overthrow the English government with the information I wheedled out of him. And then, I guess remembering that I was just a kid, all on my lonesome, caught up in the war, or more or less on the same side, he relaxed a little and said, They've been moved to, to a farm just outside of Kingley, which is a fair distance east of here, and I'm sure you'll see them again, all in good time. I was kind of taken aback by his willingness to breach the name, rank, and serial number stuff and tell me where they were, and after that, I didn't know what to say except, possibly, how about showing me exactly where on the map and leaving me the car keys in case we decide to go see them in the dead of night and never come back. I don't get nearly enough credit in life for the things I manage not to say. Of course, in order to survive, Piper and I needed to have a plan, and I was the one who was going to have to make it because Piper's job was to be a mystical creature, and mine was to get things done here on Earth, which is just how the cards were dealt. There's no point thinking of it any other way. Our major plan, which we didn't even have to discuss, was to get back together with Emmett and Isaac and Osbert by hook or by crook. So far, I was pretty hazy on the details. I did, however... <laughs> get so far as to find a road map of the British Isles hanging around the house and look up Kingley and Reston Bridge and what I discovered was that good old Major Lawrence McEvoy had told me the truth and Kingley was pretty much straight east of us and not that far from Aunt Penn's sequestered house though a little farther away from Reston Bridge than was totally convenient given the current difficulty in securing a taxi. The extremely good news was that our very own Swimming and Fishing River was near the house Swimming and Fishing River near the house was a branch of the same one that on the bridge in Reston Bridge went over, and I figured navigation-wise that was a big plus. It is probably the best to say up front that maps are not what I'm good at. So I did what every other sensible New Yorker has been doing for years at the public library. I tore the page out and hid it in my underwear. And from then on, I always kept it with me, just in case. We went to bed early that night and pretty much every other night because without electricity, and without candles, and with candles getting pretty scarce, there wasn't much point in sitting around in the dark. I didn't much like being in this boy's room with the stupid bimbos on the wall, and I know Pope Piper wasn't wild about it, or being away from her brothers either. Before she fell asleep, she said, Daisy, and I said, yes, Piper. And she said, I always wanted a sister, and if I had one, I would want her to be like you. She paused. Though I always thought she would be called Amy. I laughed a little then and said, it's all right with me. You can just call me Amy if you want, Piper. But she looked a little hurt, and I stopped joking around and said, I practically am your sister now, Piper, and that seemed to satisfy her on the subject, and she didn't say anything more about it. I didn't tell her that I had never wanted a sister. In actual fact, had spent most of my recent life desperately not wanting a sister, and that only because of the circumstances in which I was likely to get one, and besides, I never imagined how much I could love someone like Piper. Though having said that, there probably isn't another person, anything like Piper, and this side of kingdom come. She asked me what was going to happen to us, and I told her I didn't really know, but nothing could hurt us when we worked together. I asked her, do you know what invincible means? And she nodded because she's read more books in nine years than most people read in a lifetime, and I said, well, as long as we're together, that's what we are. Then she said in a croaky voice, mom must be so worried about us, and there was something in the silence that followed that sounded so desolate that I went and sat beside her on the bed and stroked her hair over and over and tried not to think about Aunt Penn's whereabouts or whether she was dead or alive. But you had to admit Piper had a point because if I were their mother, war or no war, I'd be half dead with worried by now, not having any idea how all my children were doing, and even if they were still alive. Eventually, Piper got quiet and I figured she was asleep, so I went back to my own bed and started thinking my own thoughts for a while. Now that I was away for Edmund, I could think more or less in private about all the changes that were jamming themselves into my life. And one of the thoughts I had was how could you love someone more than yourself? and worry about getting stuck in the middle of war, and ending up dead was transferred on to worrying about keeping them alive. This was all confused by the fact I loved Piper in a protective kind of way, and Edmund in a slightly different way, to put it mildly, and given that I had thought 
and I had about as much experience with sex and boyfriends as I did with brothers and sisters. It was pretty strange to find myself suddenly overwhelmed with attention from the world's biggest warehouse of magical misfits. And just to complicate matters perfectly, I was starting to feel responsible for their safety and happiness and got panicked at the idea of them being captured and corrupted by the outside world. Now, this was a definite shift from where we'd started, which was all about them bringing me cups of tea and holding my hand, and exactly when the shift occurred, I couldn't tell you. My head was kind of spinning from trying to clear this up, and I wish there was someone I could have asked about it, since I'd never read about any similar kind of situation in all the magazines Leah and I used to buy, which I guess either makes me or everyone else on the planet some kind of freak. But for once, my fate was crystal clear and wedded to Edmund and Piper's and even Isaac and Osbert's. So that was that, and I just had to get on with whatever it was required of me. This made me not quite desperate, as I had been, and I lay very still. And if I lay very still, I could hear Edmund thinking about me, wherever he was, and I thought about him back, and the bond between us was complete. I guess the difference between Jin and me is that when Jin got shut in the barn, she thought Edmund didn't love her anymore, but because I could feel Edmund out there somewhere, always loving me, I didn't have to howl all night. Thinking of Edmund like that made the single bed suddenly seem too big, so I crept in with Piper, who didn't even stir, she was so used to it by now, and I could hear Jet breathing quietly under the bed. And so with all the ducks I had left in a row, I was ready to fall asleep too. Chapter 17 Piper and I lived with the McQueen boys like people living someone else's life. Because we were part of an army family, we got a much clearer idea of what was happening in England, though a fair amount of it we could have done without knowing due to its not entirely cheerful nature. We spent a couple of days gathering information from Jane McEvoy, who liked to talk and was pretty lonely, especially since her son was away at school in the north, and hadn't been heard of since the first bombs went off, and she was desperately worried that something bad had happened to him, which seemed fairly likely to me. I went down to get some water late at night and heard her in the kitchen with Major Mac, and he was saying he was certain the boy was safe and we'll all be together again just as soon as this bloody mess is sorted. He sounded amazingly calm and reassuring, and I could hear an occasional hoarse gasping, kind of like a cry, like an animal choking to death and a noose. And when I looked through the door, I could see Mrs. M shaking all over and him with his arms around her, looking exhausted and patting her over and over and saying, now, now, love. And I decided to leave, live without a glass of water that night. The next day, her, uh, next day her eyes were red, but otherwise she seemed okay. And to make conversations, she started telling us how proud she was of her husband and that one of Manager McEvoy's big jobs was organizing a field hospital for local people because all the real hospitals had been taken over to fix the people who had gotten bombed, poisoned, or gassed in London. They got shipped out here when the city hospitals ran out of room. She said that since most of the people were in the country were only dying of appendicitis, childbirth, and ordinary pre-existing conditions, the field hospital was supposed to take care of them, while the more colorful cases of war injury got hospitals with proper walls and beds. At the beginning, she said, I went to the hospital every day. I read to the patients and played with those poor injured children and tried to make myself useful. But now they'll only let in military personnel inside due to security risk. She looked kind of outraged at this and said, as if I'm in some kind of danger to those people. And Piper and I exchanged a quick glance. And we were both thinking the same thing, namely, only if being unhinged is contagious. Later, Major M told us you'd be amazed at the number of things that can go wrong for civilians in a war. For instance, he said, let's take a kid, let's say a kid gets appendicitis or breaks his leg. Well, there's no telephone to tell someone that the bone was sticking out of his thigh, no petrol to drive a car to the field hospital if you happen to know where it was in the first place, and a big shortage of antibiotics if you did manage to get to the kid to a surgeon somehow and wanted to make sure he or she didn't die of an infection a week or so later. He also told us about people with cancer who needed expensive drugs and a pregnant woman he knew with RH negative blood whose baby would probably die pretty much no matter what and old people, some of whom would die much sooner or later of strokes or heart attacks or lack of drugs and some who already had. Another time, Major McEvoy started telling us about farm problems in the area that he was trying to control and they mostly involved cows who couldn't be milked by electric milking machines once the emergency generator stopped working and had to be milked by hand or and they could get mastitis and die. And now there's a side effect of war. I bet you never considered. Once you start thinking about all the stuff that wasn't working, it's kind of hard to know where it all ends. Like the incubators for baby chicks, not to mention baby humans, and electric fences and hospital monitors. And those things that you use to shock people back to life when their hearts stop. And computer systems and trains and airplanes. Even gas supplies for heat and cooking were regulated by electricity said Ma Major McEvoy, and how do you think you pump water out of a well? 
I felt like a science report coming on entitled Electricity, Our Helpful Friend. Then there was the problem of burying all the cows and baby chicks and people who died, and apparently there were a lot of dead things, and they were well on their way to becoming a big, stinking, rotten health problem. But that might have been too much information for me just then, and I thought I wasn't going to need another hamburger or chicken leg again in a hurry. The good major was also trying to distribute things like milk and eggs and other farm food so all the occupied people wouldn't die of starvation, and one or two other tiny details like that so you could say he had his hands full, and then some. I guess by a combination of politeness and osmosis, I learned more about farming in the few weeks we lived with me, the Mackie boys, than I ever was likely to find out in a lifetime on the 10th floor of the 86th Street apartment building, where the closest you ever got to agricultural produce was a corned beef sandwich from Zambars with a half-sour pickle, which I knew perfectly well it used to be a cucumber, but how it got to be a pickle on a plate was anybody's guess. Anyway, all this stuff that was happening under the rules of the occupation which never really struck me as entirely clear. But as far as I could tell, meant you could go ahead and do whatever you liked as long as no one told you not to. I didn't really understand the occupation because it didn't seem like the kind of war we all knew and loved from your average made-for-TV miniseries. When I heard how it happened, I was pretty impressed by the cleverness of the guys who planned it, who, as far as I understood, basically waited for most of the British Army to be lured into crises on the other side of the world and then waltzed in and cut off all the transportation and communications and stuff. So basically, they were defending Britain against its own returning armed forces rather than attacking it. Major McEvoy said, think about it as a hostage situation with 60 million hostages. So I did. I probably missed some important parts of the explanation, but that seemed to be the gist of it. And whenever anyone went into more detail, I found my brain wandering to things like, I wonder if he dyes his hair or whatever possessed them to choose that color wallpaper. They were obviously a few military types still left in England, mostly part of the Territorial Army, which sounds pretty impressive until you realize they're a bunch of moonlighting guys who spend a few weekends a year doing basic training and wishing they were the ones of the, one of the dirty dozen. Major McEvoy said it was more or less a known fact that the whole situation was temporary and by the time the British forces could get organized again, it'd be all over and the occupiers would be history, i.e. dead. But I guess the invaders were trying to make a point and had never really expected it to turn out happily ever after for them. What impressed me was how simple it seemed to be to throw a whole country into chaos by dumping a bunch of poison into some of the water supplies and making sure no one could get electricity or phone connections and sending off a few big bombs here and there in tunnels, government buildings, and airports. We also found out that the enemy was the run reason there was no gas for anyone, since Major McEvoy told Piper and me that petrol was one of the first things they took over when all the trouble started. The other reason was that you needed, guess what, to pump it out of the ground and into the tank of your car. 11 letters starts with E. I guess it shows the importance of having your own army, even a small leftover piece of an army, because although the bad guys snatched up everything they could get their hands on, at least the good guys seemed to have genuinely dedicated to distributing what was left around the place, so as few people as possible died from neglect or outright stupidity. All in all, I felt a little guilty about the fact that while us kids had been living the life of Riley, a whole bunch of other people had been scurrying around like lunatics trying to keep the social fabric from unraveling. And my personal belief was there were too many problems to think about and not enough people to sort them out. In other words, they were desperately short of people to get things done, and that gave us a chance to get out and eventually get back to where we belonged. This was obviously our goal, but in the meantime, we figured that actually doing it something might stop us from dying of boredom, which I was starting to realize was a major killer in a modern war. And so, for all our making fun of Osborne and his passion to join the war effort, I could now see that this was our ticket to getting back home, or at least that was the plan. Chapter 18. During all this time, I was in touch with Edmund. Strange as it sounds, he visited me. Not exactly like God visiting Moses or angels telling Mary she's knocked up with a Christ child, but come to think of it, not completely unlike that either. I had to be in a certain state of mind, quiet, distracted, sometimes half asleep. And then I might feel kind of like an aura, like a lightning of the space behind my eyes, and I know he was there. I could smell his smell of tobacco and earth and something radiant and spicy like amber. Could feel the smooth glide of his skin, though I never exactly saw him. Once he had a cough and his breathing sounded slow and heavy. Another time on a cold night when he kissed me, I could feel his body shivering against mine. Sometimes I could just feel his eyes on me, holding me in his quizzical wise dog gaze. And I would push off with one foot and try to coast for hours on that feeling. 
Once in a trance that wasn't quite a dream, an image of appeared in my head and I knew it was the place he and Isaac were living and I could see the people living with them and how they passed the time. Another time I heard the frail scratching cry of a newborn baby and Edmund seemed tired and cheerless and disappeared before I could find out what had happened. Whether I could feel his presence or not, I talked to him constantly, telling him about Piper and Jet and the McKee boys in our life, the way it was now. And then in the middle of some rambling monologue, I might get to the feeling that he was there listening as if I conjured him from thin air pulled him out of a hat by the ears like a magician's rabbit. I was happiest when he just came and lay down next to me. I could almost feel the weight of his body against mine. His presence silenced, if only for a few seconds, the crackling anxiety that made my blood grate against my bones, and for a little while I feel melted and soft. Don't get me wrong. I'm not about to write a scientific paper about this. I believe in the spirit world about as, about as not at all as the next person. I'm just saying what happened. In retrospect, I have to think it was kind of a connection that keeps that makes people decide to phone each other at the same instant after 50 years of not talking. You hear about siblings adopted at birth into families thousands of miles away, apart, who both name their first child Vera, dogs that begin to howl the instant their owner's killed in a war, people who dream plane crashes. It's a sort of communication there's no particular reason to believe in under ordinary circumstances, and I'm generally not big on ghosts. Ouija boards and black cats are way down on the list of neuroses I suffer from. So you'll understand why I didn't make a big song and dance about my meetings with Edmund. I wasn't even sure I wanted to talk about it with Piper. I was trying to revamp my reputation. This time around, I thought I'd be the sane one. Chapter 19. Before we started angling to get into the wide world again, the first question I want answered was well, this whole smallpox epidemic thing. Major McEvoy looked kind of uncomfortable when I asked him and said it was not a likely danger to the populace at large at the present time. And when I put on my best shocked face, he said, now, DZ, how would things be if there was nothing to stop people wandering around, spreading rumors and getting hysterical and trying to organize raids on the enemy and that sort of thing? Hmm? And then he gave me his name, rank and serial number look and changed the subject. Not being entirely witless, I got the picture that if we were going to die, it wasn't going to be from small. What was interesting about this little insight was that I could see the army had a point, but it still seemed like a sneaky trick to perpetrate on all of those simple country folk. With what, with that worry start, sorted out, I try, started trying to figure out a way for Piper and me not to spend the rest of our lives rotting in Reston Bridge. And when we were to be out in the world, possibly running into some of our long lost relatives. So after a few days sitting around twiddling our thumbs and going pretty much stark raving stir crazy trying to have a sensible conversation with while Albie whacked us on the head with a plastic sword every six seconds, we asked Major McEvoy to find us something to do because we were hard workers and wanted to help people, which was not a total lie, except the people we wanted to help were us. He looked kind of pensive for a moment and said he would think about it and get back to us. You can imagine that the good Major had a lot of thinking to do given that even in the best possible light, we're still a fairly useless pair. But then I remembered Jet, and there was a stroke of genius, because a well-trained sheepdog and someone knew how to get him to do things were just about priceless at the moment, with what with most of the local farmers dependent on herding their animals with big off-road bikes and no longer being and there no longer being any fuel. Piper knew dog training from Isaac, and the two of them, the world's foremost natural animal whisperers, and could make dogs and goats and sheep and probably bugs do pretty much whatever they asked. Just by looking at them in a certain way and whistling a low whistle, which for Isaac was especially and extremely useful, given the limits of his conversational aptitude. Major McEvoy kind of perked up at this brainstorm and asked for a sheepdog demonstration. So with a couple of whistles, Piper sent Jet out into the garden, and what do you know, he was off like a shout, crouching down low when he got to Albie, and then very gently, without being obvious, moving him little by little towards us, until poor old Albie was standing right in front of his dad, looking confused and wondering why every time he turned around to run back out to play, Jet was blocking his path. Piper gave him a pat and looked as smug as she was ever likely to look, and I thought, yes, we are on our way. Now, if only I can figure out some possible use for me before they stick me in some outbox marked cannon fodder. But it turned out that Major McEvoy was pretty nice after all, and also he probably knew that walking off with someone else's pretty nine-year-old girl, even in the middle of the war, wasn't totally kosher. And so he asked me to come along too, and I gave Piper a mental, sign, uh, mental thumbs up sign, and she smiled. <laughs>
It turned out that our place wasn't the only one that had been sequestered. A major M started ta taking us every morning to Meadow Brook Farm, which was the largest dairy farm for 50 miles in any direction and should have been renamed Fort Dix Acres since the meadows and brooks were teeming with soldiers all trying to take the place of machines. The problem was the cows had to go out every day to graze because there wasn't enough hay to feed them and they had to be brought in to be milked twice a day, which sounds simple enough until you think about 300 cows all coming and going and a lot of army guys milling around the farm like bulls in a china shop. Jet was a miracle to watch in action, and he had most of the remains of the occupied British army in love with him after the first day, and Piper was right behind him in their affections. She could get him to separate out ten cows and bring them in to be milked for the army guys, in the meantime have the next ten ready while he took the first ten back. All the big hunky army types kink it over sweet serious little Piper whistling her magic whistle and this black and white blur of a dog running exactly where she told him to. And she must have reminded every single one of them of their little sister back home or the one they wish they had back home and possibly just the Virgin Mary. Whenever they weren't doing something else, they were kind of lurking around with moony expressions, watching Piper and Jet in action. And you could almost tell that most of them felt happy just being near her in that old family magic. Piper acted like she didn't even notice all the attention, but I could tell she liked the way everyone asked her serious questions about Jet and treated her like something special. In the average morning, at least three or four big guys would hang around for ages and finally get up the courage to say, he reminds me exactly of my dog Dipper back home. Or, how does he know which whistle means what? But I got the feeling that what all they wanted to say was just, you have the most beautiful eyes I've ever seen in my life. I guess it was fairly obvious, given that she had the same effect on most people. But with all those quirky brothers getting in the way, she probably didn't get as much a chance to be noticed as you might expect. The fly in the ointment was that there was too much work for Jet and not enough for me. Having Jin around to help Jet would have solved the first problem and had been an all and been an all round godsend, but that was still left the second. I spent most of my endless hours in leisure learning to shoot a gun, which I thought might come in handy some day, if not in the war, then back on the streets of New York. It was a lot harder than it looked, but after a while I got pretty good thanks to all the expert marksmen hanging around disguised as milkmaids. I tried raising the subject with Mitch Major McGee boy of getting Jin drafted into our section of the British Army, and you could tell for a minute he forgot that he was supposed to keep us out of trouble and away from thoughts of re -gurping. because he just looked sort of absent-minded and said, no, it wouldn't be possible to get Jin right now because of the situation on the roads, and also, she's probably as useful to Gateshead Farm as Jet is to us. Thank God I have years of emergency deadpan practice because you wouldn't have guessed that Gateshead Farm meant anything more to me than porridge oats, but like any good undercover agent, I now had two names to put together to make an address, and Major McEvoy thought we were still talking about dogs. I didn't tell Piper just yet because I was hoping for divine intervention about how we were going to get to Gateshead Farm near Kingley, east of here, and when. Back to the dogs, in the end they compromised and managed to get a silly border collie named Ben, who wasn't much more than a teenage puppy to work alongside the master. Only, it didn't work out as well as you might have hoped, since he wasn't the brainiest dog in the world, and besides, was afraid of cows. It got so that Jet knew his job so well that either one of the army guys or I could take over for some of the time, while Piper tried to train some sense into Dim Ben, practicing over and over again until he was just this side of useless. He still ran away bleeding if any of the cows took it into their heads to look at him sideways, but most of the time they couldn't be bothered and he managed to muddle through. Sometimes I caught Jet giving him a look that was totally unimpressed, and I could almost see Jet thinking, excuse me, but who invited this blockhead to the party? And sometimes I wondered if he might be thinking the same thing about me. Chapter 20 Now, you might have gleaned from some of the hints dropped so far that food was not my best subject, so it was kind of ironic that the part of the army I got enlisted into was the one trying to provide it for everyone. There was a whole milk operation starring Piper and Jet the Wonder Dog, and the part that came after milking was complicated by having to heat and sterilize the milk since there were no fridges to keep it cold, and that turned out to be so hard that eventually they gave up and just served it the old-fashioned way straight from the cow. Everyone worried about uncontaminated containers, but the best solution turned out to be making people bring a bottle, and then at least the army knew the milk was okay when it left them, and if it poisoned anyone later, it wasn't their fault. There were a couple of local guys who knew all about butchering, so they were the lucky ones who got to kill and divvy up the cows, which was a lot bloodier than you might want to think, find yourself thinking about on a dark and stormy night. 
They were popular, though, and suddenly had whole bunches of friends you never noticed before queuing around the block clutching barbecue tongs. Chickens were having their necks wrung all over the place, especially if they didn't keep churning out eggs. And it was pretty surprising to me how many of the older folks seemed to be right at home strangling a chicken. Piper said it was because of the last war and ration rationing and everyone keeping chickens. And I was pleased to hear that some of the skills I was picking up would stand me in good stead in later life, assuming I have them. And finally, anyone who was healthy enough and willing to pick enough crops was hauled in to help, and that's where I came in. My first job was picking apples, which was somewhat more useful than hanging around on the outskirts of the Piper Appreciation Society. I got a lot of doubtful looks at first about whether I was strong enough to work so hard, but these days determination was nine-tenths the law, and also time went on where there were a lot of thin people around and I didn't stand out so much. I worked with eight other army people, including three soldiers and their wives and two other civilians. We started early in the morning and worked until it started to get dark, and after only a few hours, we drifted into cliques like we were all back in school. My partner... was a local woman named Elena, who was from Liverpool originally, so I didn't understand most of what she said for the first few days, and vice versa. Eventually, we started chatting about this and that, and soon the story started coming out, and I heard all about her and her husband Daniel, and how they met, what was their favorite movies, and how often they had sex, and though she was a lot older than me, and we barely spoke the same language, she turned out to be the kind of person you could talk to about pretty much anything without worrying that she'd report you to the Pope. She wanted to know all about my American and English families, even though she never met any of them except Piper, and how I ended up picking apples in the middle of a foreign country, not to mention the middle of a foreign war. Sometimes I thought I might implode if I didn't talk to another human about the events of my new life, especially the parts someone my age wouldn't be allowed to see in the movies. But every time I was just on the verge of pouring it all out to Elena, I changed my mind at the last minute just in case. Luckily, it seemed riveting enough to her that I was an American and had been sent over by my evil stepmother, which got her all clucking and tutting, and all I had to do was look kind of tragic and say nothing at all for a few minutes. And suddenly, I had a new best friend enlisting a whole bunch of apple pickers into hating Davina on faith, which cheered me up for ages. When we started work, they gave us big boxes to pack the fruit in. And the basic trick was not to throw the apples in or they would bruise and rot and ruin the rest of them in the box, which suddenly made sense of the one bad apple expression my teachers used to trot out all the time, and two if you counted Leah. We had baskets and ladders that you had to move whenever you ran out of apples close enough to reach. And when the baskets were either full or unbearably heavy, you passed them down to one of the others and they unpacked the fruit carefully and passed back up empty baskets. It didn't seem to matter whether I was picking or packing because both jobs were equally tiring. On the first few days, I had to lie on the ground for 20 minutes at a time to keep from passing out from exhaustion and the pain in my arms. Elena was nice about it and just kept working around me. It was such hard work that at first I thought I wouldn't be able to stand it. What with every muscle in my body aching and me hardly being able to climb into the truck or get out of bed the next day. But I did it because pushing myself farther and farther past what was possible made me feel calm, which is hard to explain, but something I was good at. One of the guys who worked with us was a few years older than me, and I didn't like him much, but unfortunately, the feeling wasn't mutual. He was called Joe, and he started hanging around trying to get my attention, by telling stupid jokes while we worked and asking totally dull questions like, what's it like being a yank? Elena felt sorry to Joe due to him not being the sharpest knife in the rack, especially when it came up to picking up rejection vibes. But... It was easier to feel sorry for him if you weren't the man being eyed up like prey. Maybe he's lonely, she said, and I just looked at her, wondering if she expected me to open a home for the socially challenged or what. Then she started giggling, and I had the feeling we were thinking the same thing. Namely, some people are lonely for all the right reasons. After that, we pretty much just ignored him. Most of the workers, except Piper Jet and a few others of me, lived at Meadowbrook, so we were picked up every morning at 7 and taken home at 7 every night. And every night, we fell asleep in the truck and just about managed to wake up for some food and climb into bed, and that was our day. It took a lot of getting used to, but after the first week, we compared muscles, and I told Piper all about Elena, and it almost made up for the fact that when we had a day off, neither of us got out of bed at all. Even Jet didn't seem interested in moving out from under the bed, except when we called him for food. The plums turned ripe at about the same time as the apples, and sometimes we moved from one to the other just to vary the routine. But it was much simpler to strip a, a tree of apples because they're easier to handle, and you didn't have to move the ladder so often. And when the plums fell off, 
the trees they rotted and attracted thousands of wasps so elena and i stuck with apples when we could elena was what you might call a big girl and you could tell she wanted to ask me about being so thin but being english she would rather have sawed her own legs off at the knees I caught her looking pretty puzzled a few times when she saw me nibbling at bits of lunch when everyone else was wolfing down anything in sight. And I could tell, war or no war, she was thinking, if only I had her self-control. I found out she'd been trying to have a baby for seven years and was smack in the middle of some special last-ditch treatment when the war broke out and she couldn't get any treatment now and was 43 and didn't know if she'd ever get another chance. I told her she should borrow Albie for a few days if she wanted to appreciate how great it was to be childless. When I looked at her, she was just managing to smile, and her eyes were kind of bleak, and I wish I hadn't said anything at all. After about ten days of pecking, some of us moved over to broad beans, and that was worse, because you were always bent over with a whole new set of aching muscles. But at least the beans tasted nice when you got them home and cooked them. It was getting to a point where there wasn't much around that tasted like anything you wanted to eat, and even I had to say, I could do it with a nice piece of toast, which made Elena laugh. One night, we were driving home through the usual checkpoints, and Piper and I were sleeping, and Joe, who sometimes came with us to stay at his parents in the village, suddenly took it into his hand to stand up and get off show-offy, and I guess thinking war was some kind of, like, open discussion forum where everyone was really interested in your opinion started shouting a whole bunch of obscenities at one of the checkpoint guards and when major mcgeeboy told him to sit down in a really icy army tone of voice he ignored him and kept shouting stuff about johnny foreigner being an effing bastard and worse and then in an almost lazy kind of way the checkpoint guy who'd been looking at him raised a gun and pulled the trigger and there was a loud crack and part of joe's face exploded and there was blood everywhere and he fell out of the truck onto the road Piper watched the whole thing without moving a muscle, but the shock of it made me wretch, and I had to turn way over to the side of the truck. Someone else was screaming, and when I turned back, the whole world seemed to have slowed down, grown quiet, and from inside the silence, I watched the guard go right back to chatting with his friend, and I saw Major McEvoy's head roll back for a moment, and his eyes close, and a look of despair crumple in his face. And in that split second, I wondered whether he was really that attached to the kid, and then it was the horror that I looked down and saw that Joe was still alive, gurgling and trying to move the arm that wasn't caught under his body and when i looked back at major m i realized he was doing what he felt was his duty as a member of the armed forces defending a british national and still in slow motion he was climbing out of the truck and his plan must have been to get joe on his feet somehow and then to safety when i heard about a hundred shots from a machine gun and the momentum of the blast hurled major m backward across the road away from joe with blood welling up in holes all over him and this time you could see joe's condition was 100% dead. With brains splattered everywhere, and our driver didn't wait around to see what might happen next, but just stepped on the gas, and as we drove away, I felt tears on my face, but when I put my hand up to wipe them, it turned out to be blood, and nobody turned, and nobody made a single sound, but just sat there shell-shocked, and all I could think about was poor Major M lying there in the dust, though I guess he was much too dead to notice. There never were seven more silent human beings in the back of a truck. We were too stunned, even to cry or speak, when we reached Reston Bridge, our driver, who I knew was a close friend of the Major's, got out of the truck and stood there for a minute, trying to get up the courage to go inside and tell Mrs. M what happened. But first he spoke, he turned to us, and in a voice that sounded broken and full of rage, in case anyone needed reminding, this is a war. And the way he said those words made me feel like I was falling.